appointed somehow through the democratic process. Whereas in the Soviet Union and Cuba and, and uh, all these other places, there was not a scintilla of democracy. Not that I uh, haven't benefited from Hans's book on democracy, uh, because we could uh, put, well, where do the... Um, um, where do we put um, monarchy and where do we put anarcho-capitalism here? Well, the anarcho-capitalist is obviously the least democracy and here uh, the less democracy would be better uh, if you look at it that way. So the anarcho-capitalist would be here. I guess the monarchist would be here and the, um, the, the Democrats would be over there as Hans, I, I think, uh, very aptly says that ceteris paribus, and you have to have ceteris paribus here, other things equal, monarchy is better in some sense than democracy because democracy, you're only in there for four years and you, what is it, uh, make hay while the sh sun shines and, you know, if you're only in there four years, you grab. Uh, whereas if you're the monarch, you can stay in there for 20 years and then your kid can get in there and you don't want to ruin the, the golden goose by killing it off too quickly. So you have more of a long-run perspective on it than when you're in there just for a couple of minutes. Another point that's of interest is, well, where does the U.S. fit? Is the U.S. more socialist or is it more fascist? Well, if we get back to the original definition of socialism, the economic, the pure economic definition of ownership of means of production, it seems to me that the U.S. is more fascist than socialist because how much really does the U.S. government own? And I was trying to make a list, and there's not that much that they own outright. The Bureau of Land Management owns a lot of land. The Park Service owns stuff. Then there's the buildings that they own, the post office, the roads, the Mint, the Fed, depending on how you count it. I, I try to make a list of what do they actually own outright, and there wasn't much. Whereas now, the, so they're not that socialist. Well, now, how much do they regulate? Well, they regulate everything. Uh, toilet bowls, uh, ladders, you know, you name it, they regulate it. If it moves, they regulate it. If it doesn't move, they regulate it. Since everything either moves or doesn't move, <laughs> they regulate everything. So the U.S. is not so much moving toward socialism as it is moving toward fascism if you look at the economic uh, definition of that. Uh, Gabriel Kolko was named. Uh, I want to, I think um, Butler mentioned him. I want to talk a little bit about Kolko and Stigler. Uh, Stigler had this thing called capture theory. What was capture theory? Capture theory was a theory of regulation where initially uh, you have, say, the Food and Drug Administration or the Meat Inspection Act or something like that. And the reason we have that is because, you know, capitalists can't be trusted, they're fraudulent, they're invasive, they're, they're bad guys. So we have, the government, have to have the government to come in and regulate them. The problem is that the regulators don't make as much of a salary as the vice presidents of the regulatee. And if they regulate them in a nasty way, they can't later get a job there. So they have to regulate them in a nice way. Namely, they get captured by the very people that they're supposed to be regulating. And if you look at the careers of some of these, they start off as a low-level bureaucrat, they get a middle job in private industry, they get a higher job in the, in the bureau, and then they get a much higher job, sort of a revolving door. That's the Stigler theory. Uh, pretty good. It's got some truth. But the Kolko theory is much better. The Kolko theory, I think, was called the triumph of conservatism, where he shows that right from the get-go, right from the outset, the impetus for regulation did not come from uh, aggrieved consumers or, or any of that, nor did it come from small competitors. It came from the big companies like Swift and Armour and Meatpacking. They were the ones that wanted the regulation. Why? You might say, well, why? According to the Ayn Rand view, you know, th this is hard to explain. The reason is that the large meat packers were losing market share to the small ones. And they didn't much like that. Uh, free enterprise wasn't all it's cracked up to be if these uh, lowlifes are taking our markets away. So they came up with this ingenious idea. Let's have government regulation. We, the biggies, have economies of scale in, in filling out paperwork. So anytime there's a law or regulation, we can do it cheaper than they can, so we now have a competitive advantage over them. And secondly, who do you think is going to staff those bureaus? The people who are going to staff those bureaus are from us because we're setting it up in the first place. 
So uh, Coco, I think, is much preferable. The Coco story is much preferable and much more radical than the the uh, the uh, theory of um, Stigler. Now, there's an interesting story behind Coco. Coco is a Marxist, but he's also a historian, and he's a competent historian. All he did is he went back to the records. He said, well, you know, the Meat Inspection Act came out in 1890 or 1880. I'm no historian, so don't count on me for closeness of dates here. And he just looked at the newspapers, and he saw big ads from Swift and Armour saying, yes, we need regulation. Let's have regulation. Uh, so he, w he was a Marxist, and what happened when libertarians heard about him is they started inviting him to their conferences, because this is a very libertarian message. And Kolko would come, and he'd give a speech or two, and he'd come again, and finally he refused to come. And the reason he refused to come is he was aiding and abetting the libertarian enemy <laughs> by giving his own speech. So it was, I mean, the libertarians were embracing him, and we weren't saying, you know, you have to give a free enterprise law. And just, you know, speak about was, what was in your book. And um, somehow um, th this was not acceptable. Uh, let me end on a, uh, a regulatory joke. I have to tell my antitrust joke. If you've heard it before, the, so don't, don't give the punchline away. Uh, there were three businessmen in the Soviet Union. And they were all in the gulag. And as prisoners do, they compare notes as to why you're in jail. And the first guy said, well, I'm in jail because I came to work late. And they accused me of cheating the state out of my labor services. Next guy says, well, I came to work early every day. And they accused me of brown nosing. And the third guy said, well, I came to work exactly on time every day. And they accused me of owning a Western wristwatch. <laughs> I, I once told this joke to a bunch of uh, antitrust lawyers and economists, and this joke got a big laugh. Second joke, there were three businessmen in the U.S. also in jail on antitrust crimes. And the first guy says, well, I charge higher prices than everyone else, and they accused me of profiteering and price gouging. And the second guy said, well, I charge lower prices than everyone else, and they, charged, uh, they accused me of cutthroat competition and predatory pricing. The third guy said, oh, I charge the same price as everyone else. It's hard to see how he could have with these other guys, but let that slide. And they accused me of um, collusion and cartelization. <laughs> dead silence. <laughs> dead, dead silence, because these guys knew where I was coming from. What I was going to say, and what I'll say to you now, is that this is not a law. A law is supposed to distinguish between good behavior and bad behavior. You know, you do good, you're okay. You do bad, you're, you're in jail. But here, no matter what you do, higher, lower, the same, you go to jail. I mean, the reason they were after poor Bill Gates is he wasn't giving money to the people in Washington. Now he's set up all sorts of uh, foundations and this and that and the other, and he's giving money hand over fist. I predict there'll be no more antitrust cases against Bill Gates, at least in the United States. Uh, I'll end at this point. Thanks for your attention.